support their staff is being compromised. So today we're announcing that effective Friday, hospitals will curtail elective procedures that can be safely postponed. This action will free up both necessary staffing and beds. Secretary Sutters will discuss this in more detail. She and we have been talking to the hospitals about this for the past several days. Massachusetts is a national leader in COVID-19 testing. We've been ranked in the top five states for testing per capita nationwide pretty much since April. And we've come a long way in building out a robust testing strategy. This past spring, we were completing about 3,000 tests per day statewide. Now we're completing over 100,000 tests per day statewide. We have over 350 testing sites around the Commonwealth, and you can find those on a map at a site near you, www.mass.gov slash COVID test map. We've made tremendous progress to make testing widely available, but there's always more to do. As we all know we're in the midst of a second surge. We're seeing a higher number of new cases each day, and in turn, an increase in hospitalization statewide. We're certainly better prepared to handle this than we were before, and have ramped up everything from our PPE stockpile to our hospital capacity, to our field hospital operations, and many others. And our hospitals are working day and night to provide the critical care to people that they need. But as this surge continues, we must continue to do everything we can to stop the spread and help people identify and recognize their own situation with respect to COVID. So today, in collaboration with the Command Center, our administration is announcing an expansion of our state's free testing program across the Commonwealth. From a combination of new and relocated testing sites, Massachusetts will have more testing locations available in each county to conduct significantly more tests for the people of the Commonwealth. And I would just add that all of these sites will be able to deal with the fact that it is getting colder and winter is coming. Today's plan includes three new free express testing locations in Framingham, New Bedford, and Lynn. This effort will be in addition to the $150 million investment we've already made in testing to continue to provide access to testing across the Commonwealth. These new sites will be operated by Project Beacon, the vendor that's currently running the high volume express testing site in Revere. Their model is proven to be quick and efficient as anyone can book an online appointment and visit a drive through testing site. These four locations will have the capacity to do up to 1,000 tests per day per site. The Framingham location is launching today and the rest will be open and operational by the end of December. These testing sites will also be winterized, as I said before, so as the weather turns bad, folks can get in and out safely. Today, we're also announcing the expansion of free testing in four counties, Barnstable, Berkshire, Franklin, and Hampshire. In Western Mass, free testing sites will be coming to Amherst, Great Barrington, Greenfield, North Adams, and Pittsfield. In Amherst, the command center is partnering with UMass to support free testing for residents. And we're working with Berkshire Health Systems to expand free testing across a number of sites in Berkshire County. And in Greenfield, we're providing a mobile testing service. And these Western Mass sites will be also be operational by the end of the month. On Cape Cod, Barnstable County Department of Health and Environment will be operating a testing program, including a drive through site in Falmouth. This effort was made poss possible by the Cape's legislative delegation. We thank them for their work on this and is supported with $550,000 in state funds. In total, with today's additions, the state will be supporting free COVID-19 testing so far in 25 communities. That's an increase of 17 communities compared to when we launched the Stop the Spread program back in July. Now last spring, when we first launched this program, the Commonwealth was completing around 3,000 tests per week at our state-operated sites. By the end of December, with this new plan in place, the state will have the capacity to complete 110,000 tests a week through free testing sites that are sponsored by the Commonwealth, which represents 50% increase for state-financed and organized testing sites alone. This is in addition to the over 350 existing sites across the Commonwealth. 
and our state-supported sites are extremely efficient. On average, tested, con tests conducted at our Stop the Spread sites have a turnaround time of just less than two days. And as we enter the winter months, testing will continue to be a crucial tool to fight COVID. But folks need to keep in mind that testing only represents a moment in time, and there are several other prevention measures that we must all practice every day. We all do know how to stop the spread of COVID, but repetition and diligence is key. Wear a mask in public, avoid gathering in groups, informal or formal, and please don't let your guard down. Practice good hygiene and get a test if you think you were exposed or you feel sick. It's critical that we all keep working this so that we can keep our schools and our economy functioning. And as I said before, the public health experts are constantly evaluating public health data and every option is on the table if infections and hospitalizations continue to climb. We're in the holiday season and I know folks for the most part are tired of dealing with all this but the disease is highly contagious and will continue to be dangerous for quite some time. Please continue to make smart choices and abide by the state guidelines. Just want to quote Eric Dixon, who spoke at our opening of the DCU field hospital site last week when he said two things. The first thing he said was that most people, most of the time, are doing the right thing. But what we really need in Massachusetts is for all people to do the right thing all of the time. And he then said, it's particularly important to the folks in our healthcare community who carry the brunt and the burden of taking care of so many people when they get sick. They are the ones who day in and day out, we all rely on to make up for the fact that every single day, there are people for whom this virus is hospitalizable and potentially deadly. And for them, and he commented and he said that when those folks see people out and about in gatherings and groups without wearing masks, it is profoundly depressing for them. Because they know that if people all the time, all the people played by the rules and did the things that have been advised, it would be the best and most important way we can all win this fight. We're obviously waiting approval at this point in time from the feds with respect to vaccines. Once this happens, Massachusetts will be prepared to start distributing available first doses. And the feds have informed us that we should expect to receive 300,000 first doses by the end of December. Those doses will be prioritized to frontline healthcare workers first and then to long-term care facilities. We have a comprehensive plan to distribute the vaccine in a safe and effective manner, and we'll plan to share more details with you on this on Wednesday, so that every resident will have access to more information on how this process will work. But even with vaccines coming to Massachusetts and other places around the country, we still have a long way to go, and I have to urge people once again to do their part. For weeks before the Thanksgiving holiday, we stood here and so many other folks in the public policy, government, public health and healthcare community stood at other places and said to people that it was critically important that they understand and recognize that Thanksgiving, an informal gathering among people we all know, is by far and away the most significant opportunity for spread. And we urge people to spend the holiday only with those with whom they lived so that they would not be involved in potential opportunities to spread the virus. And if you track our own data, after some of the new regulations we put in place in the early part of November went into effect, you could actually see our positive test rates stop growing, excuse me, day over day for about 10 days and then about five to seven days, which is the typical incubation period after Thanksgiving, they took off like a rocket. Thanksgiving, the ultimate informal gathering among people who are informal with each other, 
but who don't necessarily live with each other. Here, and in many other places, has been exactly the kind of event that people said it would be. I urge everybody to take the lesson from that and to understand and to recognize that if you're going to be with people you don't live with, and if you're going to be in situations and environments where masks are not already required, you need to put on a mask and keep your distance. And if possible, just simply avoid those types of circumstances and situations altogether, because they are exactly what drives a big piece of this spread. With that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Sutters. Governor, Lieutenant Governor, good afternoon. It goes without saying that our community hospitals and our community health centers are critical parts of our strong health care system in Massachusetts and key partners in stopping the spread. The recent increased demand for testing has had an impact on these community partners as well. So in response to the increased demand for testing before and after the holidays, today we're announcing that we will make the Abbott Binex Now tests available to our community hospitals and community health centers if they want them. We will distribute up to 150,000 Abbott Binex Now tests to provide increased access to rapid results. As you know, these tests provide results in just 15 minutes. These tests should be utilized to provide testing to asymptomatic close contacts and or symptomatic community members and patients at no cost through Sunday, January 10th. Administration of the Binex Now tests may be built to insurance, similar to other point of care, rapid antigen tests. Our goal is to expand access to rapid results through the holidays, while also providing additional testing supplies and options to our community health centers and community hospitals across the Commonwealth. In accordance with the CDC, the Department of Public Health has issued new quarantine guidance that takes effect today. The updated guidance to address people exposed to COVID-19 allows for the quarantine period to be reduced from 14 days to eight if they have not had and do not have any symptoms of COVID, a test, either PCR or antigen, is taken on day five or later and is negative. And lastly, they must monitor themselves for symptoms for 14 days after the exposure. Any individual that develops symptoms should contact their local health care provider and be retested. The Department of Public Health is also updating the return to work guidance, also effective today. The guidance clarifies that certain sectors may continue to work during the quarantine period to preserve critical societal functions. This is only allowed if the worker remains asymptomatic. These sectors include healthcare workers, first responders, and critical infrastructure workers. More information can be found online at mass.gov backslash quarantine. Finally, as Governor Baker has indicated, since Thanksgiving, we have seen a significant uptick in daily case counts and hospital admissions. As of the weekend, confirmed hospitalizations have increased 44% from 986 admissions to 1,416. Hospitals are feeling the strain on both ends. Increased callouts by hospital staff due to COVID exposure and infections, which has led to a decrease in the number of staff beds hospitals have available. Effective Friday, December 11th, hospitals will need to cease elective procedures and treatment that impacts inpatient capacity. This does not apply to the cancellation or delay of life-sustaining care or care that would adversely impact a patient's health. Let me be clear, this is a limited curtailment of elective procedures to promote the redeployment of staff that perform non-essential elective procedures to support the essential and urgent inpatient medical care. It is not a blanket across the board curtailment that we implemented in the first surge. Ambulatory services, preventive care, such as mammograms, colonoscopies, children pediatric checkups, and the like may continue to be available. If you're hearing this, 
please contact your health care provider for clarification about an upcoming appointment. Massachusetts is rightly proud of its health care system, and as we experienced this spring during the first surge, every hospital performed together as a unified system, ensuring that our residents' COVID acute health care needs were met. Today, our hospitals continue to step up to meet the challenges of the second surge. We need everyone in the Commonwealth to do the same. Thank you. Governor. Questions? More doctors and mayors say restrictions are needed on a statewide level and not a patchwork of community to community. Now that you're curtailing elective procedures, why not impose restrictions on a statewide level? Well, we're taking a good look at the data as we have been uh, post Thanksgiving. Um, and I fully expect that at some point uh, we'll make some decisions with respect to that. When you say all options are on the table, what does that include? We'll have more to say about that soon. Governor, last week you told me one day does not make a trend. Now it seems like it's yeah. Well, as I said, we were going to take a look at the data. We always take a look at the data every day. And we talk to our colleagues in the healthcare community, in the long term care community, in the business community. We talk to the ABCC. We talk to the folks in local government. We talk to the local boards of health. Um, I mean, between those groups, we talk to all of them pretty much every week about where we are, where we stand, and how we're doing. Um, and we continue to look at the data that's generated by the Contact Tracing Collaborative as well to determine sites and places and circumstances and situations in which there are clusters and spread, some of which we presented when we had particular uh, incidences that we thought we should share with the public. Um, and based on those conversations, um, we've taken a good hard look at the data since Thanksgiving, and we'll have more to say about that soon. Do you want to speak to this? Not out, not outpatient, but I'll let the secretary speak to that. As I said, unlike the spring where we stopped everything, um, we are curtailing inpatient elective um, treatments and procedures that impact inpatient capacity. So staff and inpatient capacity. So ambulatory outpatient surgeries could continue. We obviously want to keep um, outpatient visits such as pediatric, on my notes, pediatric visits, right, all those things, mammograms um, that we had stopped in the spring, we want those to continue. So if you think about when we first started to reopen the Commonwealth in May, um, the things that we opened in May in healthcare are the kinds of things we are continuing to keep open. So again, what we are closing or we're ceasing as of Friday are inpatient elective surgeries, procedures, and the like that impact the staffing and beds inpatient, not outpatient at this time. I mean, I, I would rather speak to the vaccine issue on Wednesday in its, in its totality. Uh, we're also going to bring with us uh, some of the folks that have been working on this issue um, who have been really sort of consumed by it for the better part of the past couple of months uh, so that we can answer sort of the full range of questions you all may have and others might have. But do you think it will go smoothly? I mean, the way that you have all the well, I guess I'd say two things about, about that. The first is, you know, you should remember that Massachusetts does every year uh, deliver a very significant number of vaccines, okay? There is, a, there is an infrastructure and process that under, in place that understands how to do this. Um, in this particular situation, there are um, some things that are unique to, to this particular vaccine. The first of which is that it's two doses, okay? So, you got to deliver the first dose, create a schedule for delivering the second dose, make sure people come back and get the second one. Um, and we are working under a variety of guidelines and recommendations with respect to how to tier the delivery of that vaccine to make sure you maximize the preservation of life 
and the support for the healthcare system. So again, I would rather have um, the folks who have really been working with this uh, speak to you in more detail on Wednesday. John, yeah. Well, the whole reason we established our Stop the Spread program in particular was to test in, in high-risk, at-risk communities. And if you looked at where we teed this thing up and where we located the vast majority of our testing capacity in Massachusetts, it was in exactly the kinds of communities um, where we believed they needed that level of support. Um, this obviously is a, is a statewide program. Um, it hits many of the same communities that we talked about before, but it expands the activity into a variety of new communities as well. And, and as I said, you know, I think at this point we have, first of all, it's winterized, which is one of the most important things for us coming out of the gate on this. And the second is uh, it's a much broader distribution with a lot more capacity than we had previously. I'm sorry, say that again? It's a mix of uh, come by foot and come by car. Yeah. Yeah. And you should speak to that one because. I also do want to point out it's um, connector open enrollment, just in case anybody wants to see what's where. <laughs> Remember, as I am still chair of the board of the connector. Um, the, one of the reasons that I announced the 150,000 for community hospitals and the and to community health centers is because, as we know, community health centers in Massachusetts are a really trusted source and they're in, in many of the communities that, um, that have, uh, have seen a disproportionality. And that is one of the reasons, in addition to the Stop the Spread sites, um, which as the governor said, were really put into, were established in communities that had high rates of COVID positive uh, and had uh, access issues. Um, and one of the things I'd say about the Project Beacon site is because it's by appointment, for people for whom standing on a line, right, not knowing how long it's going to take for them to be tested, um, one of the things about the Project Beacon site is since you can book an appointment um, and we get the results back very quickly, it actually, our hope is that it actually does sort of help people who are exactly the person you asked about, someone who, who needs to work, their, their employer's not providing the testing um, and across the, con as we continue to disperse across the Commonwealth. Yeah, there will be a pretty aggressive effort uh, to communicate it a public information campaign associated with this. It will probably involve people who are both inside the healthcare community, but also others. If you look at the, the group that was part of the um, Massachusetts Advisory Board, it's got healthcare people, but it's also got um, leaders in the faith community, it's got community health people, it's got folks in the education community. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, voices and elements of the Commonwealth represented there, and those folks have been pretty steeped in this stuff for the past couple of months. And are really exactly the kinds of spokespeople you would want to be speaking to the, um, to the importance of this. Um, I know Lewis is, and the gang are talking about this. I don't know where they are. Can we, I think we're probably gonna be in front of you five times this week, so can I come back on a, another day and speak to that? I know, yeah. Governor, last, last week there was an outbreak tied to a social club. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing more outbreaks in these social clubs? <clears throat> They're subject to the same guidelines and restrictions for others. Stay tuned. 
Are there any progress on the bids or the pilot projects involving um, possible third-party app pilots or communities that would be um, good test communities for that? I'm let my buddy, the secretary, speak for that. So the procurement is uh, under review right now. Um, so I don't have a date for when the recommendation will be made, but it's uh, the bids are in and uh, they're under review. Is there any, um, I don't know if there's any trend toward it more likely being a college community that would be test, uh, the test subjects essentially, or a local community that has? Yeah, I, I, I can't answer that at this time. So um, I talked to several mayors over the weekend um, who are frustrated with me and frustrated generally, okay? But to a person, they all said that they see in their communities all the time people engaging in risky activity that we have all been talking about as the sort of thing that you should seek to avoid. All of them. They all acknowledge, some of them talk about their own neighbors who have gatherings that are informal, that don't involve people who either live together or spend a lot of time together, where people don't wear masks, they're indoors and they spend a lot of time together. And we've been saying for months that this is, based on our data, one of the primary ways in which the virus spreads. And we talked a lot about why Thanksgiving was particularly worrisome. Not because people shouldn't be able to spend time with their families, but because this particular year given the issues associated with transmission and the fact that almost every part of the U.S. has community transmission of some, of some level and the fact that this virus in many cases remains either low symptom or asymptomatic for many of the people who get it even though they are contagious, that this would be a good year for people to just stick close to home. And I guess what I would say is um, we now have a hospital community that's really struggling. Now our hospital community is one of the most muscular in the country and one of the most creative and imaginative. And I have no doubt that we will work with them to make sure that all the people that need to be cared for get cared for. But it's also frustrating and depressing for many of the folks who work in that community to see people doing some of the same stuff the mayors were talking to me about. Because they're aware of the fact that that's exactly the sort of behavior that spreads the virus. And no one ever wants to be lectured to, and I get that. But there is a legitimate cause and effect thing going on here. And as Eric Dixon said last week, and I thought it was perfect, most people in Massachusetts most of the time do the right thing. And God bless them. Because I think a big part of the fact that our trend looks a lot different this time of year than it did last spring has a lot to do with that. But now that everybody's inside and you can't be outside as much as you used to be, it's critically important for people to up their game. And as we head into this holiday season, even more so. And I've also talked before about the fact that, you know, my wife and my circle of friends has gotten very small over the course of the past 10 months. There are lots of people we haven't seen in like forever. And I've talked about the fact that I used to have a meal with my dad every single week. And I haven't had a meal with my dad since February. 
I don't like that. But those are the those are the rules in this game that we all need to play by. To keep ourselves and others safe. Governor, can't broad, broad restrictions um, cause people to play by those rules, take it more seriously? Non-targeted broad restrictions that will make people second-guess their informal social gathering to kind of get that mentality across that you're trying to accomplish. Aren't broad restrictions affecting that? Well, that was the reason why we put the stay-at-home advisory in from 10 to 5, and we put the limit on private gatherings at 10. And we actually did see our trend flatten out as a result of that until Thanksgiving. So in that particular case, it had, and Mayor Walsh talked about this at one of his own press avails right before Thanksgiving and said, it's pretty good. We've actually seen some positive trends on our own numbers. So in that particular case, it did have some impact on behavior. And the key question here for us is, what kinds of things can we do that we actually believe will change the way people think about how they behave? And, and that's what we plan to speak about later. In, in New York, Governor Cuomo announced today that he was putting in a trigger, possible capacity to reach a certain point in the city or in certain regions of the state would uh, eliminate or curtail indoor dining. I know a lot of people I've talked to have trouble understanding that if Thanksgiving was such a risk, sitting down at a dinner table with a group of people, uh, why indoor dining is a safe activity? Is that something that you're looking at, something we can expect to hear more about? So when people sit down around a table at Thanksgiving with 10 or 20 people, they all face each other. They mingle. They're there for usually for a long period of time and they never wear a mask. And for the most part, they are also not people who spend a lot of time with each other, generally. Which is a really different situation and circumstance than families, couples, people who live together, wearing masks everywhere except when they're at a table in a restaurant and dining there. There are no rules around what people do in their own home how many people are around a table, how long they sit there, whether or not they share food, whether or not they share drink. There are no rules. There are rules in restaurants. And the rules in restaurants in Massachusetts are among the most aggressive in the country. And our enforcement policy through the ABCC has also been one of the most active and aggressive in the country as well. And when the ABCC has found people that were violating those guidance and those rules, they fined them, in some cases cited them, and in some cases closed them, which is exactly as it should be. But I think to lay this whole thing off on restaurants, as a general rule, based on the guidance and what we've seen in our own data, there are many things that spread COVID. And restaurants certainly play a role along with many others. But honestly, if you were to say to me the thing I worry about the most, it's still the informal gatherings. Because there are no masks, there are no rules, there are no guidance, there are no time limits. I mean, it's a completely different problem. Are they hearing, oh, I don't have to do that. This is guidance. It's not a <laughs> um, are, 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 are they hearing something in that term that's giving them an, an off-down? Well, I guess it depends to some extent on how aggressively um, that guidance can be uh, enforced. I mean, the ABCC aggressively enforces the guidance over the entities with which they have jurisdiction. The Department of Labor Standards, same thing. The Department of Professional Licensure, same thing. Local Boards of Health, same thing. The people who have the authority to actually enforce guidance, in many cases have successfully done that 
and incited people, fined people, and, and, and shut people down who weren't abiding by uh, the rules. You know, we don't want to call them rules or guidance. Um, for all intents and purposes, there are enforcement entities that are in a position to do something when people violate those rules. And they have since the beginning. We've been a little focused on uh, the COVID stuff for the past few days, but obviously we're currently in the process of re reviewing both of those. And we know the timelines and the deadlines that we're working on with respect to them. Um, we get 10 days in each case, and we'll be done with both of them within that 10-day period. Governor, congressional talks are back on over a federal stimulus package, uh, potentially some money in the states as well as uh, maybe transit agencies. Do you still think that full package of cuts of the T is a necessary to balance the budget? I think raising taxes to run more empty buses and trains is a bad idea. Okay, folks. You're asking me to answer a hypothetical. You're, you're asking me to answer a hypothetical. And until I have more than a hypothetical. Some of them, yeah. I think running empty trains and buses, as a general rule, is bad public policy. I think making sure that you have a system that actually serves the people who want to ride it when they want to ride it and the way they want to ride it is the right way to go. And I think the fact that the T is using this as an opportunity to continue to make billion dollar investments in their core system to modernize it and improve it so that when we get past all this, we have a much better infrastructure on which the system can run than the one we have now as their primary focus is exactly the right thing to do. And I also think the decision to say that we just can't run empty trains and empty buses over and over and over again is a perfectly appropriate response. The key question here is what happens when people start to come back? And I think the way the T is planning to do this so that they will be able to reinstate service pretty easily and pretty quickly if and when riders come back is exactly the right way to be approaching this. Thanks, everyone.